So our next leadership session is called uh, Connected Care, a Healthier Canada Enabled by Interoperability. Um, I think Shannon, I, somebody alluded to it earlier, there's been a lot of collaboration between uh, Kaihai and Canada Health Infoway. So we're really excited to have uh, Steve and Abby join us today. Um, so I will, um, I should also say that full bios are available on the app, so you can consult your mobile app for the full impressive bios of both of these gentlemen. Uh, but I will just read their titles for now, and those are impressive enough. Um, Abby Carla is Vice President, Portfolio Management, Virtual Care Programs with Canada Health Infoway. And Steve O'Reilly is Executive Director, Federal Relations with the Canadian Institute for Health Information. So uh, we're really pleased to have these two folks join us to tell us a little bit about uh, what we're doing individually and what we're doing collectively as Infoway and Kaihai. So Steve and Abby, thank you, and over to you. Bonjour, tout le monde. Je suis content. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. And an opportunity to share with you an update on the collaborative work InfoWay has been engaged in, most of you all, to advance the uh, improvement of our connected care system. We heard a lot about that in the last session. Um, as Sheila said, my name is Abby Kalra. I lead the interoperability portfolio at InfoWay, and I'm responsible for driving our strategy uh, to advance digital health interoperability in support of our jurisdictional and federal stakeholders. Giving me company today is Steve, who's going to cover an important section of this presentation, and he's going to actually provide you an update on two key national programs, interoperable programs, that the two organizations have been involved in. Um, can I say it is very refreshing to see from the patients that they actually understand interoperability. For the last few years, I have actually struggled to explain what interoperability is, so, so thank you, Flavi, for bringing the uh, interoperability definition in one-on-one -on -one for everyone, so I really appreciate that. Uh, I, so, so, so job half done, I don't need to explain interoperability anymore. Um, this conference and this presentation is about reflections, it is about appreciation, but most importantly, it is about joint leadership and joint action joint leadership and action that we must demonstrate and take to continue to advance the connected health system. Uh, in the last session, we heard some great um, comments from the three uh, provincial leaders who talked about um, access to care, who talked about the importance of the connected health system, who talked about equity of care. Those are all resounding common themes. So everybody is acknowledging that. So it was, it was really interesting to see that. So let's look back a couple of decades when our health system was pen and paper based, fax based, um, and we still make mockery of that. Um, we, we did have some standards and people often accuse us that you know, we're lagging the two industries, banking and airlines. Banking and airlines were starting to actually digitize by that time, but we're lagging behind. I think over the next 20 years, um, we have had number of standards, we've had number of digital standards number of digital solutions that have actually helped us to become digitized. Fax and paper still remains in the system, but that is not because we do not have a solution. That's because of our own choice. That's because of change, resistance to change. Um, so overall, I would say within the health space, we've made good progress, and that's why I say you know, we need to appreciate that. We have actually digitized uh, the health systems. But with digitization, the problem comes for the data interoperability. The data is sitting in our systems. The problem is it's sitting in siloed and fragmented systems. So now our journey is really about how do we unlock that data, unlock the assets that we have built, and actually take it forward. Um, I'll bring back the same thing that we talked about, you know, banking and airlines industry. The reason um, they are ahead of us is because, and I, it's very easy to say, they are a lot simpler than health system. Take, uh, take an example of banking system, two binary, uh, two binary transactions, credit and debit, right? And, and there is a business model and a business motivation globally to make it interoperable. So that's why it has happened. Healthcare, health system is local, provincial, and at best national. It hasn't even gone global right now, which is why I think there is lack of uh, motivation. Plus, health system is complex. Take an example, uh, SNOMED CT, 
we have 640,000 code values. And those code values are actually every day evolving as we learn more about human biology. And within those 640,000 codes, we have over 2 million uh, polyhierarchical relationships between them. So you can see how complex it is. It's, it's, it's easy to accuse, it's easy to criticize, but it is complex. Um, so where are the gaps? Let's, let's understand from a couple of uh, patient stories. And, and Flavi, you, you really uh, made my job easy. So these are a couple of patient stories that we have collected and learned from our uh, patient advisory forums uh, through our clinicians. And I'm trying to bring those to real stories that um, were connected the most with me. And the first one is quite similar to uh, uh, Flavi. Uh, the case of the unattached patients. Um, patients aged 12 and older, 15% of them do not have a, a home physician, a family physician. So let's talk about this patient, you know, John, who's in his late 40s. He lives in suburban Canada. His physician retired recently. He's been on a wait list for three months to join a new primary care clinic. He has uh, a family history of heart disease. He has type 2 diabetes. He's been keeping fairly okay, but recently starting to feel unwell. And he's getting um, anxious right now to get in front of the doctors. Because he doesn't have a family physician, he has attended at least four uh, multiple walk-in clinics over the last three months. He has paid two visits to emergency department uh, where physicians have ordered lab and diagnostic imaging tests repeatedly. Uh, the doctors also commented that they cannot access their past results and again sent them for repeat testing and specialist. One of the physician actually referred him to the specialist and the specialist said the, uh, his blood sugar is high and he needs to be put onto diet, exercise, and medication. He doesn't have full access to his medication history. He doesn't have full access to his um, uh, health information. Some information is available through patient portal. But, but you could see he's still waiting to get uh, to the next, uh, yeah, to, uh, to, to see the next physician. Uh, but the challenge right now is his patient summary, his record is created in multiple systems with multiple sources. So imagine, there is no single source of truth right now available. So it's not lack of solutions, it's not lack of data. It's really about connecting the data together and having that ability to actually bring that longitudinal record, you know, as some of the patients also mentioned. Um, from a health system perspective, um, look at it, what connected system would have done. As a patient, you've increased the empowerment, the patient would be able to access the result, uh, would be able to share the results even though uh, the patient is an unattached patient. The patient can get the consolidated summary and actually share with the next physician. Uh, the patient would not have to repeat the, uh, the test. From a clinician standpoint, before the visit, the clinician can actually prepare for the visit and have the full information about the patient available to him. Um, uh, from a, test, uh, from a uh, health human resource uh, crisis we talked about, you know, on an average, our physicians are spending 30 to 40 minutes looking for the administrative information for data outside their uh, home practice. Now, why is that? And, and, and they often get their information through fax. They often get their information, you know, through paper, uh, even though the system, the information, data, the data is contained in the system. So we are selectively deciding to choose fax, even when the solutions are available, even when the data is available. Uh, talk about health system, additional burden on the health system. Health human resource, the 30 to 40 minute that on an average single physician spends per day, uh, compound that over a year with 80,000 physicians and specialists, you talk about creating capacity in the system. Um, so it's not about hiring the new resources, but uh, clearing up the capacity in the system to, to see more patients. Um, and of course, reduce burden. But most importantly, uh, less anxiety for, for the patient. Uh, let's see another um, another user story, and this is something you know that um, I was discussing with uh, our uh, uh, our Dr. Rashad, who works uh, with Infoway, and he he brought this up, and I thought you know I, I must bring this up. So uh, Matt, in this case, he's a 90 year old senior uh, who suffers from dementia and a couple of chronic diseases. His caretakers are his son and daughter in law, with whom he actually live in. Um, the he has a family physician, a care coordinator, and he's receiving uh, nursing services at home from health region. Now, working with the care coordinator, his family decides to transition him to a long-term care, uh, which has an opening. The care coordinator faxes a health assessment form to his family physician that needs to be completed before the move to long-term care could be completed. 
Um, the, the family physician and the staff at the physician office fills in the information, sends it back to long-term care, and guess what? Seven different elements of information is missing from that form. Um, information about the recent hospital stay, information about the, uh, the latest outpatient specialist report, and the latest uh, complete list of medication from the pharmacy. All of this information needs to be filled into the form before the admission into long-term care could happen. The physician staff had to fax, call in, three different places, had to wait 10 days before to get the information and get the information back into a um, uh, long-term care center. Um, during this, you can imagine the burnout and the burden the caregivers are going through while they're actually dealing with their life. Look at the anxiety that it has created for the senior person. Um, the health could have deteriorated during these two weeks. So with, with a better connected, improved system, uh, most of this could have been easily avoided because the information can actually flow in a near real-time manner um, and you could actually have the consolidated view. So again, reiterating the point, it's not that you know, we do not have the assets and the solutions available. We, we haven't actually connected them well and we haven't made them interoperable. And I'm glad we're talking about it. Um, all right. So I will not define interoperability because that has been probably more eloquently uh, defined by some of the patients, so I would not even attempt to better that. Uh, but I would talk about on the left if you see, and I promise this is the only slide where I would go a little bit technical uh, for, for the interested audience. So on the left side if you see, uh, interoperability, first of all I want to reiterate, it is not about technology alone. If you look at the four layers, let's start from the bottom. Technical layer, it is really about interconnectivity of the requirements to make the system talk to each other and transmit raw data. Next layer is syntactic uh, layer. It provides the format, the syntax, and the organization of data field so that the information can flow. Uh, this is where uh, standards like HL7, XML, uh, and FHIR come into play. Uh, third layer is uh, semantic. So this is where the complex codification that I talked about, SNOMED, CT, Loink, ICD-10, they all come into play. We're talking million codes at least. How do they actually map to each other? As an example, um, a myocardial infarction, heart failure, heart attack, they all mean the same thing, but every physician may actually write it differently. They all need to be coded to a same value. They cannot be mapped to different value. So that's the importance of the code terminology. So you can imagine, you know, as the, as the codes evolve, they need to be constantly updated and maintained. And the final layer is the organization layer. This is where technology stops and we talk about all the work that done in the bottom three layers cannot proceed because either you do not have policy, either you do not have um, legal framework, either you do not have a data sharing framework, or you don't have a trusted exchange model. So if, if that is not there, all the work done at every single layer fails. So that's the top-down approach from an interoperability standpoint. From an end user standpoint, I think we already talked about, you know, this is something that, you know, when we visited the field and spoke to uh, our stakeholders. For a pharmacist, the pharmacist wants electronic, seamless flow of information flowing into uh, the workflow. For a nurse, nurse wants to access the information through one click of a button, not jump through hoops to 10 different systems to get the information, right? We talked about health human resource burnout. That's what cause, causes it. Um, from a specialist standpoint, specialist needs an ability to seamlessly exchange and share information with the physician during a care setting, right? It's not happening. Um, and from an administrator, from a health system standpoint, getting the aggregated data in a near real-time manner really helps to identify the performance of the health system and then also help assign dollars accordingly to the areas which requires improvement. So what are we doing about it? I think we all talked about the problems you know, since morning, but let's talk about you know, the work that is underway right now um, to, to advance this work. So we have been collaborating with various stakeholders in the ecosystem to advance digital health um, interoperability. And we developed a collaborative framework uh, which focuses on a number of areas, and I was making notes uh, when some of the questions were asked in the last session, and hopefully you know, this framework will start to address some of those uh, questions. Uh, first pillar is about the interoperability governance. You need to have the like-minded collaboration at the table to define where we're going, especially when each of the 13 jurisdictions are trying to achieve the same thing. So that's why you need the governance. Uh, roadmap, 
I think you would have heard um, InfoWay is driving the collaborative work to build the interoperability roadmap. It's the roadmap of the priorities that we're going to collect across the jurisdictions. And thank you, jurisdictions, you know, for dedicating your time to do that. As a matter of fact, after tomorrow's session, we're staying back for a day with all the 13 jurisdictions and their representative to extensively look at the areas where we could actually identify those base standards and make life easy for the vendors, you know, who do not have to develop the base standards 13 times but once. Uh, third pillar is the data and the exchange uh, standards uh, function. So we talked about you know, data content standards, uh, mapping to clinical standards, exchange standards, FHIR, which you may have actually heard of. It's a new buzzword. Um, it's gaining traction. Um, so defining those common standards and making it clear to the marketplace that you know, these are the ones that you need to build into your solutions to make, um, to make your uh, solutions more conformed and, and up to global standards. Uh, trusted exchange framework, um, you know, Abigail, you know, had just a fantastic session yesterday on the privacy side, you know, building the uh, privacy and security into the requirements, into the solutions, because uh, as, I, as I taught in the last framework, all the good work at the three layers, you know, stops if, if the privacy and the security and the trusted exchange uh, is not sorted out. The system, the data will not flow. It will be, it will be like a blocked pipe. So, so we will be working on the trusted exchange framework that will define harmonized privacy and security requirements, which will further go into the, um, the national procurement program that we're building, which will help us identify uh, qualified vendors who have qualified solutions, uh, 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 interoperability requirements built into that. Um, the next two pillars are really focused on the vendor activation part. Vendors are an important part of the equation. We've all acknowledged that. Um, getting their early buy-in, building their uh, inputs into our standards, uh, understanding their readiness, understanding their challenges, understanding their um, motivations, incentives, business model needs, all of those things, you know, we're currently working, running an assessment, uh, an international scan on how this is working in some of the other countries and bringing it to the Canada for recommendation. So, so these are the six pillars. And then on the right, you see the strategic investment program. Uh, which is our legacy program. We assign funding on the programs, targeted fundings, you know, linked to the outcomes. So how do we do this? Um, and I was listening to the, um, interestingly listening to the conversation we just had. Um, I heard words, um, so Shannon, Paul, and uh, Blair, seamless exchange of data, heard it from all, data access for the patients, ask the facts, um, access to care, connect citizens digitally to health system, e-referral, uh, e-lab, e-orders, and change management. Unanimously, common words, common themes that I heard across uh, the three jurisdictions. So if you look at this picture on the top, you can see this is our approach. This approach respects the fact that jurisdictions are the owner of their own roadmaps. They are the owner of their own health system. We don't need to interfere in that, you know. But a pan-Canadian approach is required to identify the base standards across these common things. If you see on the top the bubbles, you know, every single jurisdiction, I think, would relate to these bubbles. EMR migration, e-consult, e-referral, patient summary, remote patient monitoring solutions, e-scheduling, e-ordering, and patient access. Um, what we're trying to do is work with the jurisdictions collaboratively over the next two days as well, is to identify those common use cases. Because whatever work we do in the standards has to be grounded in outcomes, has to be grounded in uh, something tangible. You know, Shannon talked about MVP, you know, delivering some MVPs, delivering to the market. So identifying those um, user candidates, building those common base standards, which the vendors do not have to actually develop and implement 13 times, but once but they can actually conform to the jurisdictional requirements, which is a minimal and an incremental effort. Um, and I'll explain this with a point, patient summary. Uh, Michael, in his opening remark, you know, he talked about patient summary, the work that we have done, uh, the extensive work over the last 18 months, and we have demonstrated you know, this approach works. Patient summary, when we started, we consulted our stakeholders. It came across as the number one area which could enable both uh, the provider to provide an exchange of information plus the access to data for the patients. So we rallied together and uh, five jurisdictions came forward and, and, um, and expressed their interest to develop the, uh, the, uh, the specification. Uh, we built a pan-Canadian specification, which is called PSCA. 
Um, and that, uh, and based on that, uh, the two jurisdictions, Alberta and Ontario, they, they took that base specification and created uh, a configurable uh, specification for their jurisdictions, still, uh, still uh, tying to the original base specification. And now uh, we, we had a successful projectathon, and we have another projectathon scheduled for March where we have uh, a broader vendor community coming to participate. Uh, but think of it, you know, once, once they conform to those standards, the effort to deploy, the effort to implement within the jurisdictions is going to be incremental. And that's, that's the purpose. So we will continue to look at those examples. e referral is another example. I think there's already work being done in a number of jurisdictions, but they're all being done using local strategies. So it's an opportunity for us to uh, get ahead of that, bring it at a pan-Canadian level. Patient summary and e referral they go hand in hand. I think this slide is uh, primarily focused on um, making sure how do we actually make and enable vendors to deliver it faster. So the important part of the equation, as I mentioned, you know, is, um, is the vendor uh, community. By taking a pan-Canadian approach, uh, what we do is we're able to mobilize and activate our vendors uh, quickly. We have um, regional, local, and international vendors. So uh, they, we need to get their buy-in, not just focus on one type of vendor. Get their buy-in and commitment to deliver on those priorities. And if there are clear published pan-Canadian interoperability data and technical standards, it would also create a healthy competition amongst the existing as well as the new vendors, because when you have open standards available, when you have open conformance requirements published, uh, the new vendors, the innovative vendors, you promote innovation because they know exactly what is demanded, what is required, you know, from a procurement standpoint. So that's the purpose. So again, I think my key call out there would be that these benefits can only be realized through our continued alignment and collaboration, so we must continue to do that. Um, you'll hear more um, from Steve from ONC, um, um, and, and I'm really excited to uh, listen to him, although, although this will be third time. Uh, but, but, the fact, but, the, but, but the fact that, you know, how they have successfully implemented this um, in U.S., um, and he'll speak to that, and you would be able to relate to, you know, how, how would that actually work in Canada. Um, we talked about collaborating in five opportunity areas. So how do we really ground our work, which is the dry standard and the technical work? Oh, Info is driving the data and the standards work. But to do what? So, so I think it has to be grounded into something. So over the last four months, um, we have pretty much collaborated with patient advisory groups. We have uh, um, connected you know, with the clinician group and most importantly with the jurisdictional stakeholders to really understand uh, what are the areas where we should focus on. We can't, we can't do everything you know, in the next uh, couple of years. So uh, the, the themes that are emerging is, the first one is the data blocking and portability. The need to liberate the data from the primary care systems to start with, um, and how do you do that in a standardized manner? And that could actually help a uh, number of things. One is migration from one system to other, um, releasing the data in an aggregated manner to help the health system for secondary use. So, so that's a critical area. What is the use of the standards um, that um, in, in this particular area and how could actually drive the conformance of those um, with our, with our uh, solution providers? Uh, the second is the improved provider, um, provider's ability to add and access patient data at point of care. Um, Similar to patient summary where provider has an ability to get a longitudinal record of a patient, but at the same time be able to contribute to that information and send it back to um, a provincial repository. I think that's our end goal. That's what you know, we want to do because that's, that's how you, know, you keep the longitudinal record updated. Uh, the third theme that came across was patient access to their health record. I think we need to actually start peeling this a uh, little bit beyond the provincial portals. Um, somebody talked about, you know, in 10 years, you know, uh, our, our citizens, our patients are going to be actually demanding other channels. So how do you actually certify those other channels? Um, what are the standards for that, you know, beyond the provincial portal? How do you actually contribute data? We're talking of access the data, but what about, you know, patients actually adding and contributing to the data? These devices, you know, Apple devices, Fitbit devices, ECG, uh, A1C, all those measurements are there today. So you don't need to go to a lab to actually get that tested. So how do you actually test it and contribute back to your record? Today, we don't have that ability. I think we have an ability to access the data. So how do we do that? Um, and what work is being done um, outside? So in Europe, in US, 
they are, there's a new standard which is coming up, which is called IPA, International Patient Access, which really defines on what is a common standardized way to access your patient record, not through one channel, but through multiple channel, through certified solutions, and be able to contribute to that data. How does that happen? How do you give a grant or revoke access, you know, to your data to someone else, to a caregiver in your circle? So that's one area we will be exploring and exploring a global standard in that. Um, care coordination and collaboration. So various stand up, um, standalone tools like e-referral, uh, e-order, uh, these are all standalone solutions. Today, I think the wage restrictions are implementing. We need to actually go a step further and try to look at how do we integrate them back into the clinical workflows. Because otherwise, you know, we'll end up creating another um, siloed and fragmented economy of these solutions, and then we'll struggle to actually get the data, and we'll still rely on facts to transmit the information. So how do we integrate this into our clinical solutions and come up with a one pan canadian based solution? Good news is that is one of the area, even at our National Leadership Forum, which will continue in the next two days, as one of the area where everybody has um, uh, expressed their interest to uh, define a base standard for that. It will make easier for the jurisdictions as well as, you know, for the vendors to implement it. Um, and the final piece is the cybersecurity, super important. Um, um, not just you know from an incident response standpoint, standard practices, knowledge sharing, uh, building the capacity, the extreme shortage of talent in this space, how do we build the expertise in this space that could be actually shared and leveraged across the jurisdictions. I think that's, that's super important in this case. But also building the cybersecurity specific requirements into our, into our toolkit, into our requirements, into our procurement. So, uh, the provincial procurement teams, how do we actually educate them and actually help them, you know, build these requirements into their procurement toolkits that actually help to identify qualified vendors, you know, who need those requirements. So there's a lot of work which is required on this space. So as you could see, these are the five themes that have emerged, you know, from our discussions. Um, you will start to see some of this actually manifesting into a roadmap that we are working on, um, which will talk about, you know, what we're doing, how we're doing, and when are we delivering this. Um, I do want to acknowledge the time and effort jurisdictional teams have extended in this collaborative work to identify these common areas. It has been a lot of work, you know, in addition to their priorities, in addition to actually managing the COVID response, in addition to other programs that they're running, they have dedicated their time, which shows, you know, their sense of collaboration and the need uh, to actually do this together. So I think we're on the right path. Uh, one international perspective, I thought um, it'll be useful uh, to actually uh, share an international perspective. Um, last month, some of my colleagues and I uh, had an opportunity to attend Global Digital Health Partnership event. Um, it happened in uh, Rotterdam. Um, and the theme, of, um, the theme of the conference was really about advancing the global digital health, and interoperability was, again, uh, surprisingly, number one theme. Um, Infoway, um, Canada is represented by Infoway at that forum, and we are either chairs and co-chairs in each of the uh, five working groups that we have at the table. Um, several countries, um, they presented their overview on the local health system and the challenges that they face in advancing um, the connected care system. Uh, interestingly, but not surprisingly, all countries share the same goal, same challenges, same approach. But I tell you what, they all say we're different. Um, so, so let's just talk about, I'll, I'll bring one example. Um, so the European health data space, this strategy was written in 2020 or launched in 2020, which was for the general data space. And then they actually created a focused strategy for health data space. And they defined the scope. So, so they identified the challenges and they defined the scope. Now these are all member countries in the, in the European Commission. So this presentation was done by the European Data Commission uh, lead. Um, if you note the challenges, um, individuals and healthcare professionals have difficulty accessing the data, limited research and innovation happening because of the lack of data available, um, policymakers and regulators are not able to easily access the data, and digital health services and product services providers, they face barriers. Um, they all sound uh, familiar to us. And they came up with a, a scope statement, which they are actually putting um, as part of the legislation, which is strengthening the right of the individuals um, in relation to greater control over their electronic health data. And if you focus on the underlying words, access, share, rectify, restrict, no, and common European format. I think, I think, I think it speaks all, right? So, so we talk about patient empowerment, we talk about you know, what we need to do, I think every single country is trying to do that. Um, in this case, 
they are taking um, a top-down approach. The work that we have been doing is really a bottoms-up work. You know, the standards work, the technology work, the architecture, the conformance, the vendor mobilization. But there's a top-down approach also needed at some point. And that's what I think European Commission is trying to do, which is taking the use of uh, legislation to, to legislate the right of uh, citizens to access their data and manage and control their data. Now, automatically things will start to fall into place, you know, once the legislation into, um, is into the play. Um, I'm going to give you uh, an update on a couple of uh, pan-Canadian digital health programs, and then um, I would invite Steve to actually come and speak to the, uh, the remaining programs. So patient summary, you already heard uh, a lot from uh, uh, Michael this morning. Um, I will uh, touch quickly onto this one. What exactly is a patient summary? So any of you who has uh, an aeroplane loyalty uh, account, which I'm sure all of you must have, you know, given that you are travelers. Um, so if you log into your portal, um, what you're able to see in a standardized manner is your history of all your travel with main airline, with your partner airlines, but also some of the partner companies like Amazon, Starbucks, Uber, you're actually able to see the activity that is happening with this. So the point is that it gives you a snapshot uh, a point in time snapshot of your travel history, of your point history and everything. It's, it's similar to patient summary, not quite similar, but I, I think I had to use an example to explain the point. So, so if you look at patient summary, if I was to log into my portal, I should be able to see my full history. When I say full history, it's immunization, medication, allergies, hospital discharge summary, all of the information should be available to me. And that's the concept here. And that's what patient summary does. So patient summary is based on an international standard, IPS, um, which defines uh, these, uh, these components in a standard container. Um, and then it defines the exchange mechanism of that information, which is FHIR, you know, which is a national, which is a global standard to actually do that. So that's what patient summary does. And it benefits both provider as well as patient. Um, I think we've already talked about the outcomes. Let, let me just quickly touch on a few of those. Um, from a patient experience, empowerment standpoint, uh, great outcomes. Unattached patient, I think we have to recognize there's a problem there when, when, when we say 15% of the, uh, the patients are actually unattached patients. So patient summary does help that particular scenario, even though the information is being created and generated in different systems. Um, unplanned emergency care. So when we talk about advancing interoperability, often you know we get into debate of intra-jurisdictional interoperability versus inter-jurisdictional interoperability. But I think that's purely from a provider standpoint. From a patient standpoint, it should not matter. You know, it should be uh, cross-border, right? So no matter where I am, I think I should be able to access my results. I understand from a provider standpoint, you know, they are uh, local jurisdictional policies and legislation, um, which is understandable. But from a patient standpoint, there should not be any boundaries. Um, health human resources, I think uh, we already talked about, you know, uh, there is uh, a quantification model that, uh, uh, that we can use to actually prove it that, yes, you know, it does help. You know, it, it, near real-time exchange and availability of data does help uh, every single physician. Um, and then from a vendors and innovator, innovator standpoint, the availability and the use of open standards, it really actually helps drive the market and actually creates a good, healthy competition so that, you know, they're always um, uh, up to date. Um, good progress on this one. Um, I think uh, Michael spoke about the five jurisdictions that are participating. Two ju uh, jurisdictions, Ontario and Alberta, are already proceeding you know, with their trial implementation in the next few months. We have a big projectathon for the vendors coming up in March 2023, which is, which is I'm proud to say that you know, Canada is actually hosting it for the first time, um, led by InfoWay. It is a, a globally known event for 20 years that happens in US and Europe, but we brought it for the first time in Canada last year. Um, tasted success, now we're actually going full on on this one. All right, um, prescribe it. So while patient summary is an open standard that we're delivering to support the um, participating jurisdictions uh, in implementing pan-Canadian standards, prescribe it, which I'm extremely proud of because I was part of that team for three years, uh, is truly a pan-Canadian, fully integrated, interoperable, electronic uh, prescribing service built and run by InfoWay. It enables electronic exchange and availability of prescription uh, from EMR to a pharmacy of your choice. And 
talk about you know saving paper, save the trees. Prescribit is actually doing that. Um, what are the key highlights of the service? Uh, users are able to not only send and receive, but there's a dispense notification. Every time a prescription is dispensed, there's a notification that goes back to the physician. So we talk about closed loop transaction, right? That's what Prescribit does. Um, secure messaging, uh, additional feature, uh, clinical clinical communicator, is that still what it's called? Yes, clinical communicator, secure exchange, you know, between the uh, pharmacist and the doctors, you know, during the time of dispensing or if there's any question around it. So, so no paper, no fax, no phone. It's a clinical communicator built into the platform. Um, it leverages uh, fire standards for information exchange, which is latest, and it is supported 24 by 7, 365 day operationally uh, in both English and French language. Uh, momentum. Uh, six jurisdictions were already live. You're starting to see that hockey curve um, in the middle graph. Uh, 10,000 prescribers already enrolled and growing. Uh, and finally, from an EMR community standpoint, you know, great effort, great commitment, um, great dedication to actually bring uh, the platform compliant to we prescribe it. Um, I think um, I've already spoken about some of the benefits uh, from a patient standpoint. Safety, few medication error, access to their own prescription, ability to order refills themselves. From a prescriber standpoint, safety, 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 and time savings. Uh, pharmacist, improved workflow, um, less prone uh, for error, and more time for the patient consultations. Um, and finally, from the health system, you actually get, you can get um, information in an aggregated manner um, if you need to. And you can actually decide, you know, in terms of uh, taking action against, let's say in case of an opioid emergency. So you have the information available to actually take those actions. So that was my section. And uh, I would like to invite Steve to come in and uh, speak to the next two very important programs. Hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, uh, Steve O'Reilly, originally from Newfoundland, uh, provincial health CIO in a previous life. Uh, Abby, you just covered an enormous amount of content, uh, and Newfoundlanders are famous for talking incredibly fast. I'm going to bestow honorary Newfoundlander status on you. <laughs> so uh, I'm also a bit of a people watcher, and one of the nice things about sitting up on the day is you can sort of watch body language, eyes, and I know we're all absorbing a whole lot of content, so I'm going to be exceedingly brief. Uh, I hear we're having a hot lunch today, and so between now and noon, we will finish on time. That's my solemn vow to you. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, ODT, as well as the primary health care content standard. Uh, before I dive in, I just want to highlight, uh, I hope you're all, for those of you who've been around the system for a while, this collaboration between our two organizations is quite striking and quite positive. And we've been nurturing that, I think, for the last few years. And we're really starting to see that pay off. And I think with interoperability, you're really going to see our organizations align even better. I just wanted to get that in before, uh, before people glaze over. OK, so ODT. And there is a session tomorrow that will provide a pretty detailed flyby of this. So I'm not going to belabor it too much. But I do want to just note, um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, what we've been told by the players in organ donation and transplantation is this lack of a data repository and some way to measure system performance is the Achilles heel. It's what's holding us back. And there's some numbers there in the corner. Suffice to say, we're not transplanting as well as we should or as often as we should and as efficiently as we should. Uh, and I believe the latest numbers, like last year, I think we lost 250 people on the wait list. So we can do better is the key message. So I won't, uh, won't drill on that too, too much, but I do think we all recognize when it comes to organ donation, the need is always greater than the availability, so we want to optimize that. Okay. We're taking... Oh. I always point at the screen, I don't know why. Uh, so we're taking a three-pronged approach to this, which is really involving deploying tech solutions to replace a lot of that outdated systems, papers, facts that we've heard so much about this morning in telephone calls. Secondly, we want to integrate systems, including existing systems. So it's not ripping everything out and starting again. There's lots of COT solutions out there. It's more about alignment than integration. And perhaps most importantly, or certainly from my perspective, um, the project will be funding the initial investment of embedding the content standards in, into the technology solutions, both new and existing. And that's been our challenge. 
uh, not just in Canada, but certainly marrying data and content standards to the technology and the messaging standards has been our biggest challenge. And I'm quite excited to see this come through. And I think ODT represents a real demonstrable example of interoperability for the country. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the accomplishments. Suffice to say, there's both a deceased donor and a living donor solutions that are moving along nicely. I believe the first phase of an integration hub, which is pretty cool, is to allow provinces to share offers of donations across both borders. Again, not getting everybody right away, but this is the beginning of something that will scale up quite nicely. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I would encourage you, there is a session tomorrow that will go through the details on this. And so let's talk for a minute about primary health care and the common data standard for primary health care. So some of you may know, um, CAIHI has published a content standard for primary health care, but it's historically been focused on the administrative performance management side of health, uh, primary health care. And so it didn't cover the universe of users. And what we've done in this partnership with InfoWay is really take it to the next level to build an interoperable common data standard with the provinces and territories, with the partners. Uh, we want to leverage what's being done across the jurisdictions, and we want to do that for all the potential users, not just from an administrative lens, which would be uh, CAIHI's historical uh, approach. So we really want to take a whole system approach. And so you can see the different user groups here, excuse me. So it's, you know, it's not just for, uh, I think we call it clinical operations here in Bullet 2, which as a former, uh, as an escape hospital administrator, I can assure you, we, uh, we use it for all kinds of things. But in addition, it also represents the needs of, you know, the clinicians providing the care, people trying to do planning at a regional or provincial level or a pan-Canadian level, and of course for population and public health. So the notion is we're going to create a common data standard that supports all user needs, and I think that will make this much more compelling as we go forward. Uh, a lot of benefits to this. I'll just highlight a couple. I think as a patient, just getting access to your data is probably job one that I can share it with people as I choose to. I don't have to repeat the same things over and over. Uh, a lot of duplicate tests and appointments and wrote business cases a lifetime ago about how we'd save money by freeing up capacity by introducing these things, so it's pretty cool. Obviously for providers, it helps enable collaboration coordination. They don't spend so much bloody time chasing down information and trying to make sense of it. So that administrative burden, which we heard a lot about from the panel, that's real. Um, again, we've rolled out a lot of EMRs in this country. We're now starting to make them more clinician user friendly, if I can say that. Uh, so it all comes with time. And then lastly, and perhaps some would argue most importantly, the decision makers, the people who fund and monitor and run the system. Um, so many opportunities to improve health system planning by doing this. So we're quite pumped. To me, this primary health care interoperable standard is a key, key piece. There's many good things we'll do, but if we can get our minds around what's happening in primary health care, it's, it's a huge chunk of the system, and it's where all the safety gains and the capacity improvements and a lot of our HHR challenges rest. So i got to show this. This is the million dollars pipeline slide, as Abby likes to call it. So we uh, spend a lot of time briefing senior, senior, busy executives and policymakers around what the heck is this interoperability all about, what does it entail, how are Kai high and InfoA, and you'll notice we even got StatsCan in there because they're a partner with us on some of the content standard sides. And I won't walk you through this, but you can see it's color-coded. There's roles for all partners. And it really does show the taps on either side is what we hope to get, that good, clean water, good, clean data. And so with that, I think, Abby, you wanted to say a few things in closing? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, indeed, a million-dollar slide. It really, uh, it really required some thinking to actually put this together. Um, to close things off, um, I would like to continue. I would like to thank you for attending the session, and uh, leave you all with a key message, which is the importance of the continued collaboration. I think we have demonstrated that over the last few months. Let's continue to do that uh, because we're all chasing the same goals. Um, and finally, I wanted to remind you of all the great concurrent sessions you know that we have tomorrow. Um, there is some rich content, you know, that you will witness in those uh, sessions, you know. Uh, I probably touched some of them at the high level, but you, if you really want to learn more about each of the area, you, I, I would humbly request you to go there. 
Um, there's one on organ donation and transplant. So we have um, Dr. Joe Kim come in, uh, who's the sponsor, and speak to that. There's one on patient summaries, and then there's one on um, one title, Canadian Helping Canadian. Now, these are not all the sessions, but uh, so team, here's my pitch to recruit people for your sessions. <laughs> Um, and anything related to the content, if you have any questions, I'm going to be around. I know we don't have time for the question, and I don't want to actually uh, delay your lunch. So if you have any questions, I'm going to be around for next two days. Please, uh, please uh, reach out to me and enjoy the rest of conference. And Sheila asked me to remind you that the lunch will start at 12. It served hard, and she has reminded me to tell you to come back at 1.15, which is when the next session starts. Thank you.